I studied philosophy of mathematics and political science. Um, and after I graduated, I went to grad school and then to work in investment banking in New York. Um, I did come back to rowing and rode uh, at an elite level for a while after that. I went to the Pan Am Games. Um, and since then, I've for the last 10 years, I've been focusing on PCR. On uh, my professional life, I am a partner at Mercator Advisors, which is a boutique consulting firm that focuses on transportation infrastructure finance. And I will hand it off to Margot Shumway. Margot, you're on mute. All right, I lied. I will hand it off to Megan Welsh. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Welsh. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I started rowing my freshman year of college at UC Berkeley. I had never heard of rowing before my first week on campus at UC Berkeley. And when I was walking through the gym one day, some lightweight rowers approached me and said, hey, you should be on our team. And the rest uh, is history. Um, I rowed for about a decade. I was the first woman to row all four years um, for Cal's lightweight rowing team. Um, and it is a club sport. Uh, lightweight men and women's rowing is not funded at UC Berkeley. And so um, it was a whole lot of uh, fundraising and a lot of work to kind of support and sustain ourselves. I know a lot of folks on the call can identify with that work of, of sustaining um, a rowing program. Um, and then after college, I moved to Philadelphia uh, to row and train at the elite level. Um, while I was there, I completed my master's degree in social work at Temple, so go Owls. Um, and I, at the same time that I was rowing at the elite level, I was also a coach at Bachelor's Barge Club um, in Philly. And so I'm really excited to connect with you all around these important issues of gender and diversity in rowing. Um, in my professional life, I am an associate professor of public administration and criminal justice at San Diego State University. And I do work on police racial profiling, gendered and racialized criminalization processes that happen in our criminal legal system. And since moving to San Diego, I have started to study homelessness pretty intensely because it is uh, a huge issue here um, and in many other cities in the US. Um, and so that's a little bit of what I'm about professionally. And I look forward to connecting with you all um, on this important panel. And I will hand it back over to Margot if uh, tech, the, the tech goddesses are <laughs> with us now. Can you hear me? Oh my gosh, so embarrassing. Can you hear me now? Like, it's like the thing of Zoom. Um, I am Margot Shumway. I uh, am a technical recruiter at Amazon. Um, I've been a lifelong athlete. I played basketball and soccer as a young kid and then found rowing really late. Uh, I actually walked on to the rowing team at Ohio State my fourth year of school and rowed for about a year and a half and then decided I really liked it and thought the next logical step was to just try and make the national team. Uh, so I continued rowing after college for about eight or nine years and then stopped rowing in 2012 started a family, got a job, and uh, have two little boys and an amazing wife. And I live here in Seattle and very, very excited to be here and share stories with everyone. Tiffany, you wanna go next? Hi, my name's Tiffany Macon. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, I grew up in the Central Valley. Uh, it's about 90 minutes from the Bay Area. Um, I went to school in Syracuse. So whenever I'm not wearing uh, navy and gold, I'm definitely wearing orange. 
so I went to Syracuse for four years, uh, finished there, decided uh, I still needed to hide a row. So I decided to move to Boston and row for Riverside. Uh, knowing the sport of rowing, you don't make money. So I needed to work and I or had the fortunate opportunity to scale a middle school program at CRI. So basically we taught uh, middle school age students how to row and we brought them out to the water, uh, part of our outreach program. Uh, when I finished kind of my rowing career in Boston, I decided, well, I knew I wanted to get into college athletics, didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do. So I did a array of volunteering uh, from working at the conference level uh, to working um, small little events around Boston. Uh, and I found development and I've loved it ever since. Uh, so I worked in Syracuse for two years on the development operational side. So dealing with premium ticketing, also dealing with all kinds of funds on the back end and basically accepting gifts and making sure that we were uh, putting them in the right account decided that wasn't for me. I didn't like staying behind computers all day. So I got into front, front facing fundraising. Uh, so what you would consider, uh, you know, development in front of prospects and donors. So I currently work at Cal Athletics. I work with women's rowing, men's and women's water polo, track and field and cross country. I will shoot it off to Megan O'Leary. Awesome, thanks Tiff. Uh, I'm Megan O'Leary, um, pronouns she, her. I grew up, I moved around a lot, but I grew up mostly in Louisiana. So like Megan Welsh, I did not know rowing was even a sport until I went to college uh, at University of Virginia. I was actually a two sport athlete there. I played volleyball and softball, um, but my first year roommate was a rower and then head coach Kevin Sauer definitely picked me out as a tall person on campus and said, you should row. Um, but I didn't pick the sport up until after I graduated. I was working for ESPN in Connecticut and Googled it, found a boathouse, um, went to a learn to row, loved it, and ended up um, kind of like Margot coming to the sport later in life, decided to, to chase the dream, um, pursued the national team, uh, made the Olympic team in 2016. I'm actually still training, hopefully competing this summer for my last games. Uh, we'll see. Uh, my event is the women's double. Um, we've medaled a couple world championships, hoping to medal in the Olympic Games. Um, on kind of the other side, not rowing life, I've co-founded a startup. It's a software startup and it's called Terrazzo. We help companies, mid to large companies, recruit and hire more inclusively through a platform. Uh, I also serve on the U.S. Rowing Board of Directors. I'm in my second term, involved with a lot of committee work um, in that role. Um, but yeah, really excited to be here. It's fun seeing a lot of um, old faces that I knew as I came up through my rowing career, um, but excited to be here. I will, who are we missing? I feel like I was one of the last people. Olivia or Amelia, do you wanna help me out if, if there are any more introductions? Uh, yeah, I think you're the last person. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you panelists for those wonderful introductions. And our first question, we're gonna jump right in, is uh, can you share a story about a woman in your life that got you into sports and inspired you to stay in them? All right, I'm gonna have uh, Catherine answer that question. Okay, um, well, this is pretty easy because I would say two of the people that have where the biggest influence on my rowing career are on the call, Megan Welsh and Margot Shumway. Um, Megan was my locker next door neighbor when I first started sculling and joined Undyne. And she seemed like incredibly cool and incredibly tough and way too busy to talk to me. Um, and so I thought, she's really cool. I think maybe I'll stick around and perhaps I will one day become as cool as her. And then uh, I grew up a little bit and I basically just wanted to be as fast as Margo in the single and never got there. <laughs> but uh, both of them were huge inspirations for me. And I think one of the neat things that I loved about rowing is that the people that you look up to, it's such a small community. You end up meeting them and working with them and training with them. Um, and I think that's, it's unique to the sport and how small and insular it is. Uh, it's one of the nice things about that. Um, 
Well, I'll go. Uh, I would say a woman that was inspirational to me to just in general and being in sports uh, was my mother. Uh, she grew up, she did some sports here and there, but that really wasn't um, her, I guess her calling. Um, but I had a ton of siblings. I had brothers that played sports, but I think it was really important uh, that she pushed me to play sports because she knew the benefits around just being competitive and sticking through things. So um, I'm definitely gonna give that one to my mother, I'm gonna say. Yeah, I'll add to what Tiffany said. My mom um, is quite the athlete and I think helped sort of introduce me into sports. I also have two brothers, um, but my mom would tell stories. She was in college when Title IX really was starting to be not even just passed, but actually <laughs> um, implemented in ways that colleges had to pay attention. And she was tapped and pulled into to participating in a lot of the sports that her college at the time to get the numbers. And she used to tell just these horror stories of they'd travel to events and have to sleep on the gym floor because the college wouldn't pay for hotels. They wore the football jerseys as their old football smelly jerseys as their jerseys. Um, and just the early days of, you know, what it took to be uh, an athlete, a woman, a female athlete. Um, and sort of, you know, I've, I've held on to those stories is really understanding how lucky uh, of the opportunities that, you know, that I have um, because of women like my mom, but, you know, during the, the 70s and 80s when it was really, it was hard to get opportunities. So I would, I would definitely attribute my mom a lot to what got me into sport. Um, and what drew everyone to the sport of rowing specifically? I'll go. Um, I, <laughs> so I, I came to rowing late. I was a fourth year at Ohio State. Basketball was my first passion. I thought I was going to like walk onto the team there and that did not happen. D1 basketball school. Um, and I was running one night around the track. Um, it was called the French Field House, and I was just trying to get a workout in and um, this, this woman in khaki shorts, I distinctly remember, started to like cross across the track right as I was rounding a bend. And I was like, what's going on here? And I was kind of had my headphones on. I was trying to do my own thing. And she just kept coming at such a pace that she was going to get right in front of me without me being able to round the, the bend. And uh, it turns out that was the novice coach of the rowing team there. Her name was Kristen Mermagen. And she looked at me and said, oh, hey, sorry, are you an athlete here? And I said, no, meaning, are you an athlete at the school? And, uh, and she was like, well, do you want to be? And that obviously intrigued me. And I remember we sat off to the side of the track on a couple of uh, wooden crates that they had probably used for workouts earlier that day. And she said, you have the perfect body for rowing. You should, you should try it. And at that point in my life, no one had ever told me I had the perfect body for anything. And I was like okay, you've got me, like you hooked me, I'm willing to try this. And, you know, a couple min couple months later, I ended up having my first practice. And I thought rowing was erging initially. I didn't know you actually like went out and got in boats because it was winter. Um, but I would say, you know, I think as young women and older women, we have a lot of pressure to have perfect bodies a lot of the time um, for all the wrong reasons. And so for me to have a perfect body for the right reasons, which is you could be a phenomenal athlete. That was, you know, initially something that really attracted me to the sport. Uh, I'll chime in and um, agree with Margo that uh, when those folks at the, the Cal Rec Center approached me and said, hey, you have the body of a lightweight rower, that was mind blowing to me because I had come from a background of being on the swim team in high school, which is just so laughable because I'm barely 5'5", five five, like on a really good day. Um, and before that I was into playing basketball and I just keep having this proclivity for choosing sports that uh, don't really like short people. And so to find my people, um, and of course most lightweight rowers are quite tall, but to feel like I had, uh, a place to belong and that was welcoming to me of at my size was really nice. And I'll just, I'll also answer the previous question just real quick. 
I stayed silent for that question when it was thrown out, female uh, role models, because I don't know if any other, anyone else had this realization when that question was thrown out, but um, I realized that all of my role models early in life around athletics were male. And I think that in a lot of ways that really shaped my identity. And I really did not think at all about pursuing athletics at the collegiate level, I think in large part for that reason. And my coach at Cal was this awesome feminist man, a former lightweight rower at Cal. And he bought us all at one point, this book called The Red Rose Crew. And I only thought of it because Megan O'Leary mentioned Title IX and The Red Rose Crew, if folks haven't heard of the book, um, is about one of those very initial, really kind of pathbreaking um, women's crew. Um, and I'll drop the link to the book um, in the chat if folks are interested. And so I think reading that book really uh, opened my mind to the to the gender dynamics at play in sport and in rowing in particular. Thank you for that, Megan. Uh, that actually goes perfectly into our next question. That's specifically for Megan O'Leary. And uh, we just wanted you to speak on your role as an ambassador for women, uh, for the Women's Sports Foundation. I know you talked about it a little bit earlier. Yeah, so the Women's Sports Foundation is um, a great organization, does a ton not only for you know advocating for policy, um, and they go to the Hill and advocate for policy to support Title IX among other things, um, but just growing awareness about the power of sport for young girls. Um, I've been a two-time recipient of their travel and training fund grant. That is what sort of brought me in as an ambassador and as, as part of my thank you and giving back to them helping support my pursuit of being an athlete. Um, I do everything from you know attending panels that they hold sort of like this to um, they you know pre-COVID would have events, an annual event every year, um, a big gala, but also uh, they call it the um, ALC, the Athlete Leadership uh, Conference, which is a really fantastic event. So they have done a number of things for them and with them, look forward to hopefully being included, you know, involved even more when time opens up after the Olympic games. Um, but a great organization that, that does everything from award grants to um, really move toward maintaining and improving policy uh, that supports, again, um, getting young girls and keeping young girls in sport um, and even later in life as well. Um, so Megan, is there a specific goal or achievement that you're working towards? You spoke a lot about like the policies, but is there anything that you're currently working on right now? Yeah, so I mean, for me personally, what I what I'm doing with them is sort of in terms of, um, you know, as an Olympic athlete that's training, I try and help amplify the work that they're doing. So they've been doing, you know, what's great is that they do a lot of work toward getting money into the hands of whether it's even, you know, they're they're doing work toward it's like the Tara Van, I'm going to screw her name up, Vanderver Grant, getting more women in coaching positions. So they're trying to change the ratio of women coaches because to Megan Walsh's point. Um, as we young, you know, as young women growing up, I bet the majority of our coaches were male and that is, they're trying to change that because that will then, you know, if you see it, you can be it, um, in terms of just changing our role models, but also who we're looking up to, to help lead the way. Um, so I know that that is a, a new kind of a new, bigger push. Um, after each Olympic games, they also come out with, if I'll speak through my Olympic hat lens, they come out, they sort of do an executive report or, you know, a deep dive report rather an executive summary, obviously, but changing, you know, the 2020 games are going to be the first, they're calling it the first um, gender parity at 48.8%. That's not, that's not 50, 50, right. <laughs> but the women's sports foundation has been pushing toward at least um, doing reports and exposing, trying to push the big events um, toward true equality to, toward, you know, true gender representation in events, participation. Um, beyond that, they do a lot of work and through my lens of being previously with ESPN around increasing media exposure, that is so, so important. So going back to changing the ratio of coaches, changing the ratio of uh, the coverage for women in sports is so important. Um, and again, I'm gonna use Megan's example. When I grew up and you young people, on the, you won't know, but VHS tapes were a thing. Um, we couldn't DVR and I would record 
every single event, women's event that, that was on TV and it wasn't that many. I was a big fan of the 99ers, the, the Women's World Cup in 1999, Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, and I recorded every single game that they showed on TV because I could watch it over and over because that was the only way that I could consume women in sports on TV. Um, now it's better, it's still not great. And so that's another thing that I know that the Women's Sports Foundation is working toward is how can we improve um, women's you know, coverage of sports like the WNBA obviously is leading the way, but other sports included. Thank you, Megan, for your response. Um, so women are, like you said, vastly underrepresented at all levels of sports. And to throw out some numbers, 40% of teen girls do not participate in sports compared to 25% of teen boys. Only 24% of all head coaches um, at the collegiate level are female and only 3.2% of sports media coverage is devoted to women's sports. So does anyone have any thoughts on some actionable steps that we can take to change this? Um, I'll, I'd love to jump in there. I think one of the biggest issues that I see in sports, particularly at the grassroots level, is how much of it has become pay to play. And the rising cost of youth sports is a huge barrier for an increasing percentage of our country. And so we can't talk about, well, why aren't more women playing sports if those sports are becoming less and less accessible to more and more of the population. So I think oftentimes the conversation about involving women, women in sports focuses on like, oh, well, what's wrong with the girls? Why aren't they motivated to go out for teams? Um, and I think the flip side of that is we're making it really, really challenging for a lot of people to access sports, to afford them, but also to feel included. And I think the wave of legislation against trans and non-binary athletes that we're seeing at the national level certainly does not help folks that identify that way to feel welcome in sports. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that uh, we're doing wrong from a policy and structural perspective that we need to answer for before we start thinking about, oh, why aren't girls excited about sports? Um, yeah, so I'll hand it off to others. Well, that was nicely answered. So I'll just move on to the next question. Uh, the other question that we had was, um, the, like, how can we keep more women in coaching roles? I'll take that one. Um, myself, at one point, I thought I was going the route of a collegiate coach when I was uh, living in Boston. Um, and, and after talking and working with coaches, I, I think a big part of it is, is just the, the support. I mean, when women go off to try to have families, it, it's really difficult when they have to keep a strenuous uh, schedule and still take care of the family. Um, so a lot of it is, is the support from the administration um, in general and just, you know, giving them the opportunity to, to bring uh, kids the practice to to bring kids to competition and, and giving mothers time uh, away without feeling like they're going to lose their position. Um, I'm I'm going to stereotype a little bit, but most of the time when male coaches are coaching, they don't necessarily have to take a long time away from a sport, so um, that essentially gives an advantage. But um, that being said, I, I do know a male coach who took a uh, paternity leave and I was all for it. And uh, it was kind of looked down upon, which I don't understand why, because um, fathers are just as important as mothers. But uh, I think we need to do a better job of supporting women uh, to do that. And also uh, just encouraging uh, women to be become uh, assistant coaches and you know, encouraging them to go out for head coach roles. Uh, a lot of the times as women, we feel like we have to know everything before we pursue the next uh, position where uh, my male counterparts do not believe that at all. Uh, so uh, I think just encouraging more women to go out for positions that they uh, essentially do not feel qualified for when in actuality, uh, there are a lot of qualified women that could 
um, take on some of these big time coaching positions, not only in women's sports, but male, male sports. We're obviously seeing it right now um, at the NBA level and the NFL level and, um, you know, seeing a little bit on in the enrolling at the collegiate level. But uh, I think we just need to continue to, um, you know, push the narrative that women can coach at the women's level and male level. There's, there's really no uh, ceiling when it comes to coaching. I think I I think this is a really complex question, um, and there there's no immediate, evident, easy solution to it. I I coached on and off from 2005 until 2015, every level of athlete you can imagine. I coached you know little kids, freshmen in high school. I I coached 70 and 80 year old men. I've coached at the collegiate level. I've coached at the club level. I've coached private lessons. Um, and I, I think for me, part of my transition into quote unquote, the, the real world or the corporate world is I need to be able to support myself and my family. Uh, you know, we have a house, we have a mortgage, you have bills, you have diapers you need to buy. Um, you're trying to set your kids up for their future. And you can't do that on a coach's salary. Um, and, and on top of that, I'm the type of person. So, so I would have stuck with coaching. I love coaching. I, it's something that I miss. Um, very passionate about the sport. I, I love being able to translate my athletic experiences to hopefully helping people achieve their dreams. But it wasn't sustainable for me for all of the reasons I listed before. And I think on top of that, I'm the type of person who likes to progress my career. I like to, you know, continually push my limits and expand my scope of impact. And there was no path for that in coaching for me. I applied to head coach jobs at the collegiate level. I applied to assistant jobs. I didn't even get a response. Um, so I think I don't know what the root issue is. I would have coached men or women or, you know, anybody. Um, but I just think it's to tie back to what Catherine said, it's a lack of access. You know, there's no pathway for me to get into that head coach role at a UW or an Ohio state. And those opportunities only open once every 20 years sometimes. Um, and so it, it's a lack of opportunity. It's a lack of, you know, ability to progress your career and, and further develop your skills and have a, a bigger impact on a bigger number of athletes. And then on top of that, it's just financially and emotionally not sustainable. It's a grueling schedule. I was coaching, you know, 30 days in a row. I was, I was working every Saturday and Sunday. Um, I don't mean to be super depressing about it. Like there were really great things about it too. I mean, it's part of the reason, you know, I have such a vast network of people that I really care about. Um, and, and it's fun, you know, I didn't coach Tiffany directly, but I was at Riverside when she was there. So it's, it's like a full circle moment to be on this panel with her. Um, and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been a coach, but it is, it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, cause there really isn't a clear path to get there. And there's not a lot of support, like Sif Tiffany said to, you know, to make it happen. So, yeah. One thing I want to add that Margo touched on too, in terms of access and opportunity and sort of the well, lack thereof is you can't talk about hiring coaches without talking about who's doing the hiring. We need more women who are ADs. We need more women who are associate ADs. We need more women in the front offices with the you know professional sports leagues being in charge of identifying talent and pulling them in because I guarantee you that'll help. So you, in terms of the conversation and where it also needs to change is that full ecosystem of who's in charge of hiring, who's in charge of, you know, pulling in um, new talent and diversifying how we're thinking about who can coach men. Of course, women can coach men too. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that is a, you know, I can count probably on one hand. Yeah. The number of women who are athletic directors at D1 schools in this country. And that, that's sad. Um, and that needs to change. Um, and so that's one thing that I, I just wanted to add on to that, that I think is a huge lever in how that can be improved as well. I can add one thing to what Megan said. It's just that it, it can't all be white women either. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty important. Yeah. And when I say women, I can probably count, I think there's two black women who are ADs in this country, um, which is, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's a bad stat. 
Yeah, so that actually goes perfect into the next section that we're going to talk about. Um, so this year, we've seen some great leadership from female athletes around social and racial um, injustice issues, including the WNBA uh, and the U.S. women's soccer team, as well as Simone Manuel. So um, the question is, uh, how can we address these issues within our own sport and even on our own team? I guess I can go first. Um, I've been harping on this issue now for over a decade. So um, I think rowing in particular has a lot of unique and very deep challenges around diversity and inclusion. Um, there are a lot of structural issues and I don't just mean physical barriers. A lot of times the conversation in rowing gets focused on um, very physical, very simple issues and fails to address uh, the larger issue of inclusion and really creating sort of structural justice and also an environment where people feel welcomed and empowered. It's sports, you don't have to do this. This isn't a workplace where you're getting paid. The goal here is not to like have everyone tolerate one another and get along. The goal is for people to have fun because that's why we play sports ultimately. So I think if we use a sort of legal mindset or a corporate mindset, it doesn't work in sports because the goal isn't just for people to function together. The goal is for people to be a team and to have a good time. Um, so I think as a sport, uh, rowing has a lot of really hard work to do. And I know that um, a lot of the people who are on this call, both the panelists and the folks who are attending are people who are doing that work on their teams, which is fantastic. And hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss that a little bit more in the breakout groups. But I think, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here since you guys know a lot of this stuff, but um, addressing the structural issues, ad addressing the interpersonal issues on your team, making sure that folks are educated allies, supporting uh, BIPOC folks and other folks with minority identities, making sure that we're not just focused on access, that we are focused on true inclusion um, and then I think there's a lot of bigger issues that need to happen sort of at the policy level. This is not something that's going to change with all carrot and no stick. Um, we can't just like lure people into DEI trainings and hope that everyone emerges newly woke. Um, there has to be accountability and there has to be consequences for people who aren't rowing in the right direction. Um, yeah. I think I'll stop there and let others, let others chime in. Yeah, I mean, Catherine basically laid it out, you know, what our sport has been dealing with when it comes to in, in inclusion. Um, and, you know, the pandemic, I always tell people the pan pandemic was the, the perfect storm. Um, I myself in general and just people in general have a little more time to slow down and kind of really look at um as as a nation just in general um kind of where where we're missing the mark and a lot of it is is racial issues um and being exclusive i mean a lot of that comes from just not taking the time to be aware and a lot of it too is also uh part of just a long history of, of excluding groups. Um, and I think the only way we're going to work to be more inclusive is one, the biggest thing is just identifying and saying, yes, this is present. Like that's the biggest issue uh, some of us have just in these groups that don't necessarily understand uh, the issues. What may, maybe because you haven't been exposed or exposed to the issue or just don't quite understand it, um, the biggest issue is just saying, hey, yes, this is present and we need to, to tackle this. Uh, so I think that's the biggest step and uh, the pandemic has allowed that step to happen. Uh, so now it's really pushing uh, to kind of work through what these racial issues are and put, like Catherine said, put policy in place that um, kind of necessarily not necessarily force, but kind of show people like, hey, this is the way we want to go with being inclusive in our organization. And if, you know, you 
you don't want to be a part of that policy or be a part of that wave, as we would say, um, you know, then you don't have to be a part of what we're trying to do here. So, uh, yeah, I would have to agree with Catherine on, you know, working towards inclusion and, and really identifying where we're missing the mark. I just want to echo everything that Tiffany and Catherine and others have been saying here. Um, as the or one of the researchers or uh, data nerds on this panel, um, one way we can hold people accountable to Catherine's point is through data. And those data points that Olivia read out, wow, what did you say? 3.2% of media coverage? Uh, 25 percent of boys are not participating in sports, but double that for for your girls and young women. These numbers and and other numbers need to be held up and need to be talked about and need to to be put in the the policy sphere. And so Megan O'Leary and and Margot and Catherine, maybe you guys already mentioned something around an equity dashboard, but. I find numbers to be really compelling and really, uh, for lack of a better word, black and white. These disparities need to be held up and highlighted and interrogated, and they need to be used to start a conversation, you know? And Tiffany, you mentioned the pandemic. We're in a double pandemic, a public health crisis and a racial injustice uh, crisis that has been centuries in the making. Um, and I think that not everyone is persuaded by evidence, but a lot of folks are. And I, so I'm curious if there are any efforts to kind of shed light on some of these uh, disparities and to have folks really have to answer to them. Um, my kind of follow-up question that I was gonna interject at, at some point is I'm, uh, everything I know about uh, the DEI work in athletics, I've, I've learned from my BFF Catherine here, but I am trying to do the work, similar work in higher education. I am trying to hire new professors who look like my students so that they can see themselves in their instructors and see that that is, is a goal, right? As a possibility of many. Um, and so we're looking we're doing really hard work at looking at graduation rates by race and gender and um, socioeconomic status. And I just wonder, you know, so it's interesting to be on this panel and to hear these conversations happening. So I'm in the university space and we're talking about hiring practices on the athletic side. It does not seem like the two worlds are talking to each other. Um, the way maybe they could be. And so I'm just curious if there are any kind of broader conversations around data and just kind of institutions talking to each other around these issues. Yeah, that point you made about universities not communicating internally is some, a conversation I've had with a number of collegiate rowing coaches. Uh, and I know Caitlin has been part of those conversations as well to say that there are professors who actually study, you know, when coaches throw up their hands and say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to talk to my team about these issues. I don't know how to recruit more diverse athletes. I just, I don't know what to do. I don't have any time, whatever. Um, and they're saying this sitting in these universities that have, you know, that are doing the research, that are producing the research that we're all reading about in the newspaper. Um, like, so Megan talked about the impact that research and data can have, and she was part of the New York City's um, study of misdemeanor misdemeanor stops, part of stop, uh, stop and frisk that ended up getting a lot of news coverage and actually did change that policy. So um, just want a little shout out there that sometimes data does have a really profound impact. And I think that one of the issues I have with growing at this point is that there's I think this goes to what Tip was saying. So like people are just kind of willfully ignorant. There's a no, there's really a level of discomfort with collecting that kind of data. People don't want to ask because they don't want to know what the issues are. Um, so I think what Megan pointed out 
both on the side of collaborating with, with acad academics, like particularly for university teams. And then the second piece about really pushing the need for better data. Um, Cause I think if we, if we actually knew what percentage of rowers in the United States weren't white, I think it would be, it would be pretty small and a shockingly large percentage of them would be on this call right now. So that's not good. Great, thank you, Catherine. That helps transition us to our next question that's actually directed towards Tiffany and Catherine. Um, but what struggles, if any, did you face with academics or rowing at a predominantly white institute and how did you overcome these obstacles? Man, um, gosh, representation is everything. Um, I must say I was in a position where um, at the point that I started at Syracuse, uh, my close friend now, Rachel, who was on the junior national team, she was already at Syracuse. And then we had a walk on Coxon um, that, came from the same community that I did. So they, they were both uh, familiar with black culture and whatnot. Uh, my close friend, Rachel, her family is actually from uh, Nigeria. So she, she's aware of the, the, the African community also, but um, representation is everything. That, that played a, a big part of me making a decision. Uh, because I knew at the end of the day, if I, you know, was a freshman and was having issues with other teammates or coaches or teachers or anything, I had a group to fall back on and feel like they understood what I was saying. Now, there wasn't a point where I had any issues, but just knowing that I had that backup it was huge. Um, and also, I, when I initially got to Syracuse, I made sure that I knew um, my academic counselors that I uh, talk to teachers and, and kind of understand who they were and got a felt of, um, you know, were they willing to, to be open minded to, you know, some of the things that I would present because of my background. Uh, so I really kind of dug into that. Um, you know, I had a couple assistant coaches who, you know, now having conversations, you know, 10, 12 years later um, after college, really saying like, they didn't understand necessarily where I was coming from um, because they just never asked. And, and so I think a lot of that happens from just kind of assuming that, you know, all is okay because there, there are other, you know, black students that are, um, you know, within the department and you kind of find your, you find your group or you find other uh, coaches that you can go to. Um, and one of the coaches, she really realized that she needed to kind of educate herself on uh, communities that she didn't grow up in. So um, going back to the question, uh, what challenges, I was kind of lucky in some ways that I had those teammates um, if I didn't, I, I definitely think that I would have uh, reached out to other student athletes on other teams and other assistant coaches um, for that support because it's, it's hard being 3,000 miles away and, and if some, something comes up, I call my parents, well, what are they going to do? They can only reach me within, you know, 10 hours if I really needed them. Um, and if I needed somebody immediately, I, I needed to make sure that I had that person. So um, in some ways, I, I was definitely, definitely lucky in that respect. Um, so I'm going to correct the last thing that Tiff said. I don't think she was lucky. I think she was really smart. And there were a lot of great strategies there in terms of finding her allies, networking with professors, networking with other coaches. I didn't do any of that. And it was awful. <laughs> So I highly recommend doing what Tiff did. Um, I just had no friends in rowing um, and rowing took up almost all of my time. Um, so thankfully there were a couple of lightweight guys that kind of took pity on me. And so I had like a few friends, but the only 
female, like other woman from the rowing team that I am still in touch with is the only other black girl who came a couple years after me and then ultimately left the team. Um, but she was sort of the only person that I was actually close to. Um, so I think using all of the strategies that Tiff outlined is definitely a better route than attempting to like forge through college uh, without maybe taking your own race into consideration and like adjusting for the fact that you will be experiencing some level of racism, particularly within rowing, but also like, um, I did manage at like, at the end of my college career to find one black math professor. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I had been working with him for four years, this would have been very different for me. Um, but I came to those realizations really late and I wish that I'd been, as Tiff was, much more intentional about seeking out those networks and building them. If, if I could just jump in and, and highlight something from Catherine and Tiff's narratives here that, I don't know, could, could move our conversation forward is the responsibility was all on them. Right, everything that Tiff described was something that she had to do herself. And this is a reflection of our individualistic society, of course, but it's also part of the solution, right? If we can unpack that and address it. And I know that there are lots of folks on the call who are thinking about mentoring and, and perhaps you already have mentoring programs formally or informally, but Anytime, I think, when we can move away from individualistic solutions that put the solution responsibility on the person who is affected by the disparity, and here we are talking explicitly about racism, it is the work of those of us who are in institutions who are wielding this racialized power to dismantle that. And I don't have all the answers, but I just wanna call out that important theme of personal responsibility that our society holds up. And that can be an incredible strength and driver of innovation, but it can also really hold us back, especially in conversations about equity. Thank you. Um, Megan, what has your education or even research taught you about being an ally and the importance of intersectionality? Oh, we, we don't have enough time for a full answer about that. Um, and I don't even know where to begin, but I guess what I just said kind of sums up what I've learned over my decade of, of looking at this academically. I am usually in my work looking at uh, institutions such as our criminal legal system. No, I'm not saying justice in that term because whether justice is actually served in our current system is a topic of much debate. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the racialized dyna dynamics that play out in policing um, and in our social welfare systems. Um, so public assistance, food stamps and things like that. And uh, yeah, what I just said about the work that Tiff and Catherine had to do to find their way through collegiate rowing is exactly what folks have to do when they're caught up in the criminal legal system. It's exactly what folks who need financial assistance have to do. They have to take on all of that work, even if the circumstances that put them in that position were not of their own doing, right? Um, and so anytime we can kind of flip that on its head and and ask more of our systems um, and really hold up a mirror to our systems. And I guess that's my, my point about data because that gives us a great kind of leverage or wedge to drive into the narratives that institutions like to perpetuate that, you know, that racism has been solved in some way. Institutions like to do that a whole lot and numbers are a great, great way to hold up a mirror um, to that and really question that. 
thanks for the question. Can I add one thing to, or just amplify something in Megan's response? I think that being friends with Megan and having known her now for a long time, it helped me shift my idea of what a good ally is, right? Your expectation of your friends has to be high. It has to be worthy of, of your self-care. So if your friends are not helping you to care for yourself, and part of that is caring for your identity, your, your gender identity, your sexual identity, your race, um, if they're not on board with that, and they're not, not only are they not responsive, but like what you should look for is people who are leading you, people who are helping you uh, proactively, as opposed to just being reactive to the discrimination that you're facing. Um, so I think that through Megan's work and also through being friends with her, it really taught me how to raise the bar for what I should expect of my friends and allies. Likewise, Catherine, I'm tearing up over here a little bit. Uh, that was very nicely said. Um, so just moving on, our next question is, how did rowing set you up for success in the professional world? I think this is something uh, that maybe Margo could speak on. Yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, I mean, I think, gosh, it feels almost vulgar to transition from what we just talked about to like corporate world, but it's important. Um, I, I think rowing just makes you tough. I mean, it's a, it's a tough sport to do. It's physically demanding. The hours are bad. You're up before the sun rises. Um, sometimes rowing after the sun sets, you get blisters, you have to wear spandex in public. Um, it's, it's physically grueling. You row in the rain, you row in the snow, you row in the wind, you have to carry heavy equipment. Everything about the sport demands a lot of you, uh, and it can be very draining, and I think it, it just makes you tough. Um, I think on top of that, it can make you keenly aware of how to be a good teammate um, and how not to be a good teammate. Uh, I think it teaches you how to collaborate with others and care about something that's bigger than just you. Um, teaches you to care about others' success and hold them up. Um, and so I think there's, I mean, there's the, the list is endless for me in terms of uh, the lessons I learned from rowing and how they help me with my job currently. I mean, I think I'm a good teammate. I think I'm very aware of when my teammates are struggling and I try to help out. I, I think I understand human emotion. I think I understand how to get through ups and downs um, because rowing just kind of inherently teaches you all of that. You know, you're, you're, you're working together in an eight or a four or a pair or even a single, whatever it is. And you've got to figure out how to do this thing with this equipment and all these other people who have their slightly different way of doing things. and. Um, I think, you know, the, the mental toughness, the physical toughness, and really it almost makes your job feel kind of easy sometimes. Like, you know, it, it, I, I hear people talk about how difficult their jobs are. And I'm like, try getting up at four o'clock in the morning and doing a 2K. Like, you don't even know what hard is. And so I think it can kind of help you put things in perspective and, and feel like, wow, I did this really cool thing that nobody else has done. I, I can bring that to the table. I can bring my toughness and my determination and my ability to be aware of others and, and want for them to be successful. That adds value that, you know, other people just haven't had the opportunity to, to develop because they haven't done the sport. I was going to add, but I think Margo covered it. Um, I had a, it was actually a rower say to me the other day that, um, one of the biggest things that differentiates rowers in the workplace, he now works at Google, um, rowers from others is that ability to grind, that ability to understand this is just a tough day or this is just a challenge that I need to work through instead of like being paralyzed by what's, what's being given you a task, a project, whatever it is at work. And very quickly, you, re you, know, you realize how valuable that skill set is that you've 
you've cultivated over four years of collegiate rowing, high school rowing, whatever it is um, that can be applied toward whatever challenge you're facing is that ability to grind through it and understand that, yes, it's going to hurt maybe real bad, but I will be able to get through to the other side. And that will be something that will carry you for the rest of your career in whatever, you know, whatever industry, whatever job, whatever, you know, task that you're going to face. Um, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly pl played out that way for me in my professional life. Um, especially for startups, most entrepreneurs quit because it gets hard. <laughs> and so if you're interested in starting your own you know, business one day, being a rower will, will certainly help um, navigating the challenges that'll be, you know, that'll, that'll surely come your way, um, but they won't scare you away. Um, I think I, most people say they learned a lot about teamwork uh, from rowing. I think I learned that I'm a single scholar. Um, but I, but I also learned, uh, I think it was David Banks who told me that um, you don't win seat races by being the fastest person. You win seat races by making everyone else row their fastest. Um, so although I don't think I, I think I learned that my best team environment is a team of one. Um, I also really grew in my appreciation for how important it is to make sure that you're contributing to everyone's success around you. That like you getting faster, you getting better is ultimately not nearly as powerful as you getting a little bit faster and everyone else getting a little bit faster too. Um, so I think that's something that even though I tend to prefer not to work in large teams, um, when I am in a team environment, that's sort of the mindset that I try to be, try to bring to it. Yeah, uh, gosh, rowing, how has it helped my professional world? Um, I mean, as a, a, what, a junior, right? I mean, I learned the biggest lesson of all, uh, just accountability. I, I started, you know, started off uh, my collegiate career, um, as a freshman went through that whole year and my sophomore year I was basically out with a shoulder injury and, and ended up with surgery and I was coming back and of course you know you want to get right back into the thick of things and my coach absolutely told me I had to make a mark before I got back with the varsity group and I missed that mark by under a second and I was like okay it's just under a second and he did not let me join the top group and I think from that point like that taught me a lesson just in general of accountability um, that has really stuck with me and and it's translated to the the professional world for me um, you know if, if you're not hitting your mark um, that's the reality of it I mean you can't sugarcoat it uh, you can't take it personal. You just got to continue to work through uh, the challenges that are you're facing that hit the mark and, and continue to push through and you'll find yourself successful. So I really use that throughout, you know, the time that I was transitioning into the professional world. Uh, there was times where I wasn't hitting my mark and I was put on what you would call a work probation. Uh, was I upset? Of course I was. Uh, but that being said, uh, I worked through that and it made me, you know, a better, um, you know, a, a better leader, um, you know, accountability. Uh, and I would also say rowing, um, you do a lot of networking. And I think people forget a lot of your progression in your career uh, comes from networking. You may not notice yourself networking, but uh, that's really how you make a progression through your career. And I, I felt when I graduated from college, it's like, I don't know how to network and I don't understand that networking and all the time when I was coming through college, I was doing networking and didn't realize it. And once I realized that I knew how to network, it kind of opened up, you know, different doors for me, different avenues. Um, and it helped me to understand that, you know, networking, all it really is, is understanding what somebody else is trying to accomplish and offering yourself uh, to help them get through that situation in hopes that when you're in need, you can count on them to help you uh, to progress in whatever area you're looking uh, to progress in, whether it just be 
and a goal or whether it be looking for a, a position or a job. So uh, those are probably the two big things that Rowan had helped me and or has helped me uh, within my professional world. So. Awesome. Thank you for those great responses. So some of you touched on this, but what was the transition like from rowing into the professional world? Just keep rowing as long as you can. <laughs> I kidding. think Margo should answer this one. Yeah, Margo's great for this. <laughs> what? Because I never had a job before? <laughs> no. Um, at first, it was a total shock. I mean, I, I'd been in rowing, I felt like, for so long, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I think the reason why I was attracted to sports and, and rowing in general was I just wanted to push it as far as I could. I'm... I'm a limit pusher, I think I would describe myself as. Like I, I like seeing how far I can take something and, and really stretching the bounds of what I'm possible of. Um, and, but then, I mean, when I stopped rowing, I coached for a little bit, but then when I, I started to look for a different career, it was really, really challenging for me because I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, I felt like I was back in college trying to pick a major. Um, and I just really felt like I was adrift and had no direction. And I think to Tiffany's point, like the best thing you can do is network, reach out to people that, you know, have conversations, generally be curious. Um, and ultimately that's, that's what led me to my current job is I ended up having coffee with someone who was a recruiter at Amazon and got referred to a program. And then I ended up getting hired and, um, you never know where those conversations are going to lead. And so I think just a piece of advice is just be open to them. You know, it might not be what you want to do for the next 20 years of your life, but it could be a doorway to take you to that, that ultimate career goal of yours. So, um, yeah, initially just felt totally lost, but once I got in it at Amazon, it again, felt like a place where I could really push my limits and just learn a ton. And I'm amazed at the progression that I've made in the, in the past three and a half years, moving from the rowing world to, uh, you know, a big tech company and, um, yeah, I think just be open, network, and, you know, you'll figure it out. Um, I think I also really benefited from the networking and rowing. Um, in particular, I, so I went into investment banking right out of school, and that's not something that anyone in my family had ever done. It was not, you know, a job that I knew existed before I went to college. But the folks that um, the guys I was friends with in college, a lot of them were in the business school. They were interested in finance. I ended up meeting people's parents and talking to them about their work. Um, and so as to Margo's point, just being a little bit curious opened up sort of a different professional avenue than I would have considered previously. Um, and now I really like finance. Great. Um, so we're going to keep moving on with our questions. So how do you think that we can um, continue or how do you think we can, can continue encouraging women to see themselves in leadership roles? If no one else wants to go first, I have a little angry rant about that topic. Please, I, I want to follow you so badly. <laughs> um, yeah, so similar to what I said earlier about girls in sports, I think that um, empowering people who have been historically disempowered doesn't just mean like adding some white ladies to the patriarchy and sprinkling some people of color on the top. It, it really means rethinking what it means to be a leader. And if we're doing anything else le like less than that, in the name of empowering women, I think that we're selling everyone short, particularly all of you who are younger than we are. Um, so when I think about how can we help women to see themselves in leadership roles, I think that it's incumbent upon all of us who are in leadership roles to be critical of them and to reimagine what they should look like so that we're, we're changing the system to make it something 
that you all are excited to be part of and that it's not, you don't have to come into work every day and put on your like work face and be somebody that you're not and try to pound yourself into the round hole or the square hole or whatever to fit in. I think that we need to make leadership roles authentic and inclusive of different identities uh, and different people in a way that they haven't been previously. Megan? <laughs> no, I mean, that, mine was gonna be the, it's, it has to come from a almost, <laughs> you can't just carve out a couple spots and be like, well, that's for the women, that's for people of color, that's for whatever the other, um, because I think that that's how a lot of um, ads been done, done in the past is just, I like the, the sprinkle on top analogy um, that it does have to uh, come from the people that are in the leadership positions to say, this isn't enough. Um, and to understand how, um, you know, say we got to that place and then understand that it, it still needs to change. I talk at length, I have a good friend that got hired um, at, by Zoom, a very high up position. And like, it's her, it's her mission to, because it was so difficult and she understands how unfair and unjust that process was um, to now use that position to change it um, and not to just hold on to her spot that she got. Um, to make sure that she's able to um, fundamentally change the path that she had to endure to get there. Um, so, I mean, I think Catherine articulated it quite well, so I don't want to, but just that idea of it actually is going to take people to not be scared by losing their position by helping others um, and to, to not be fearful that that is going to in any way take away all the work that they've done to get to that position as well. Oh, it looks like yeah. Megan, Megan had to hop. Bye, Megan. Um, how do we think we can continue to encouraging women to see themselves in leadership? Um, I'm going to go the route of continue to, to pull each other up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm about reaching back. Um, and I purposely, I will always say this, I purposely place myself in uh, situations or uh, groups that um, there's no one that looks like me. Uh, so helping to change perception. Uh, I just think that's kind of the only way to, to really uh, show the talent of just women in general, people of color, however you want to put it. Um, just sticking myself in situations where I don't belong. Um, I'm, I'm, I would like to say I'm okay at that, but um, yeah, and then hopefully, you know, sticking myself in positions that it kind of changes the, the mindset that what we call the, the typical leader, uh, white male, has on women, people of color, um, and, and hopes that, like, hey, like, you know, I'm just as capable as, you know, the, the young guy you have your arm around, and, and in some cases, better than what he's doing. So, um, my hope is really just to continue to, to push uh, against, you know, push against the people who are at the top and say, hey, um, you know, why is it, you know, this person, you know, getting this role? Not to say that they don't deserve it, but I want to understand so I can get there. Um, and then when I get there, my hope is like, hey, I'm, I'm opening the door for other folks to, to run through, um, you know, and, and hopefully while they're running through, the leadership sees that, hey, like, you know, it doesn't matter uh, how old you are. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter uh, your the community you come from or the culture or nationality or whatever we want to, you know, put labels on. Uh, so that's kind of how I figure to kind of help, you know, women, people of color through leadership is to try to put myself in some type of spot and, and say, hey, I'm holding the door open. And yes, these people have the ability to do what I do or even better. Um, I believe in, you know, bringing along people who are better at something than I am, because ultimately, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm in a position that I know everything, which stops my growth. So um, that's kind of how I, I look at leadership and to figure out ways to, to push, um, you know, women through, push people of color through. Just one more note on that. I think uh, I've really benefited professionally from having colleagues uh, that were good allies and that were willing to be educated about this stuff. Um, you know, I'm 
most of the time in you know finance and economics i'm often the only woman in the room usually the only woman in the room um and so i've had clients where i was leading a meeting and my colleague they would only direct questions to my colleague and he would just keep referring Catherine's leading this Catherine is the person in charge and repeating that over and over and over until they accepted it um but it takes it takes getting folks educating them so that they're aware and that they're seeing it and and now after 10 years of working with my partners they're the ones that are like I can't believe that that guy talked over you during the meeting like we have to stop him. Um, so I think as you, as we go along that path to leadership, um, the people that hopefully not only are we holding the door open, we're getting other people to hold the door open for the people who are coming after us. All right. Thank you so much. Now it is time for our Q&A section. And the first question is from Emily. She wanted to know, what is your best rowing memory and what impact did it have on you as a person? I see this is bringing back a lot of memories. Uh, I think someone else should go. <laughs> uh, I'll go first, I guess. Um, man, it's like pulling back from the recesses of my mind. Um, best rowing memory. <laughs> it was either the first time I actually rowed when I realized that it was rowing and not erging, <laughs> um, because erging is not the most fun. Um, I'll, I'll talk about actually a time that I, I, I failed. Um, I was rowing the single, I was uh, competing at a, a selection regatta and you know my goal was to win and then go and compete in the single internationally. And I was just, I got destroyed. I, I was just like way off the mark, not even close. And I had a, another race coming up a few months later and my goal was a little bit different. You know, I still wanted to win, but I said, you know, I need to do everything that I can to feel good about the result, whatever it is at the end of the race. I trained hard. I stayed healthy. I had a race plan. I followed it to a T. I had a fantastic race and I still didn't win. But in my mind, I crossed the finish line and I realized that was everything I had. <laughs> I had put mentally, physically, emotionally, absolutely everything I had on the line, but I didn't win. And while it was disappointing, I realized that at the end of the day, for me, if I can live with what I gave, if I feel good about what I gave and it still isn't the end result that I want, that's okay. And I think we have a culture that really prioritizes winning everything and gold medals and being the best at everything all the time. And it actually detracts from the experience of it. Um, I, I think while that's the, the cherry on top sometimes, I think you'll find that oftentimes when you do win the race, we don't really know how to enjoy it. And then it passes by so quickly, you're already on to the next thing. So I think what it taught me as an athlete, and this was when I was pretty far into my rowing career, was that the, the process matters and the journey matters. The end result, while we want those two things to align, the, the journey and the end result, that's the ideal, it doesn't always happen. And if you, can, if you can live with what you put out there at the end of the day, win or lose, um, that's a really, really valuable thing. Cause I left the water that day feeling like I couldn't have done anything else. That was what I had. And I was proud of that moment, even if I, you know, it meant that I didn't get to go and compete internationally. Okay, well, Come we on. on. 
No, nobody wants to follow that, Margo. <laughs> um, I feel like so I'm the womp womp. <laughs> My stories are all like womp womp. <laughs> Usually that's me, so that's why I invited you. Um, all right, so we'll keep going with the questions in the chat. So a question from Mac is, is there any, is there one thing that you wish you could tell your younger self regarding being confident as an athlete and what would that be? I guess just that you're fine. Like, however you are, it's good. Um, gonna be okay and just whatever you think is wrong with you like it's okay to work to improve but like there's nothing wrong with you you're fine um and I think that's probably given how society treats and marginalizes women I think it's important to remind ourselves and remind each other um frequently that the way you are is good Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time uh, being very hard on myself. Um, and I think there's a difference between setting high expectations, holding yourself accountable, and being very hard on yourself, to Catherine's point, negative self-talk or believing maybe what others are telling you that is wrong. Um, and I mean, I, as I, I'm not even going to share my age, but I think I'm just getting to that place where I've realized how destructive that has been to my progress as an athlete but that can also carry over to your relationships to your professional career to all these things and so if there's one thing that you know in sports is such a great arena to really suss that out um, is yeah like don't be so hard on yourself there's a difference between having high expectations but you have to have a level of empathy and self-compassion um, or it, it will paralyze your progress I guess I can piggyback off of that um, with just saying um, what I would tell my younger self is listen to my coach TK about the 24 hour rule. Uh, Tom Keister, you know, would tell us you guys got 24 hours to be upset with your performance. And I would take 48 hours. And I'm like, there's no reason to take 48 hours to be upset about, you know, Tuesday's pieces where I just, totally fell flat on my face uh, because I decided I wasn't going to follow some type of recovery aspect that I should have, uh, whether it be because I was trying to get some work done or whatever it may be. Uh, so I would definitely say the, the 24 hour rule. Um, I think I would have saved some other following training sessions from that. Um, but now that I understand, you know, the whole 24 hour rule, I implement it now. Uh, with my current work and, and also um, my training as an amateur bodybuilder is like you have 24 hours. I mean, you're not going to be perfect. Um, you're going to make mistakes. And the quicker you can move on, uh, the quicker you can improve on, on what you're, you know, falling short on. So uh, definitely use the 24 hour rule. All right, our next question is, what is one thing that you tell yourself to get through the hard times of rowing? Talking the early wake up, the blisters, the hard pieces, the failed 2Ks, all of it. Uh, there's a donut at the end of the line? I don't know. <laughs> I was just gonna say, bacon, egg and cheese, bagel after practice, you're all good. You forget about that erg piece real quick. <laughs> Pumpkin scones, perhaps, Margo? 100%. <laughs> All the scones. Uh, Is that I, a good enough answer for you guys? Can we just say food? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a rower, I did think a lot about food. But no, I, I honestly think that, um, what did I tell myself? Um, you know, I had trained and did the mileage to get through this this hard piece it's just a matter of me keeping a positive attitude and um just know that I'm gonna hurt I mean you just have to know you're gonna be in that place where uh your legs are gonna hurt your your you know you're gonna 
at some point lock eyes with your coach and just hoping they'll tell you to stop, but they're not going to tell you to stop. So just know that. Um, and when you get to the end point, know that you, you gave your all, even if, you know, at some point during the piece you, you had a lapse, you, you know that, hey, I, I pushed through that. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I told myself. Yeah, uh, it matters is sort of what I, a little mantra is even the bad workouts matter and finishing the workout matters even more. If you're showing up every day, especially in college when lots of your friends are having fun and staying out late, um, it means it matters to you. So that means that those tough workouts and that one erg piece that you're just like, meh, I'll, I'll back off on this stroke, that, that matters to you. And I think reminding yourself of it um, can, for me at least, has helped through some of the more challenging days is that, yeah, every, every stroke, every day, <laughs> every bit of it matters and it does add up. So do donuts. Awesome. Um, and another question from Claire Barrett. Do you have any advice for women that are going into fields that might not be in direct positions to make social or policy change that want to make a difference in the world for women and other marginalized groups in general? I'd like to answer that. Um, I think that all professions have an opportunity to create social change and make a difference for people. Um, Megan Welsh, who unfortunately had to leave us when she was in her master's program for social work, there was like a technical term that they would call it like the helping professions. So like social work, psychology, like those sort of professions that we think about as being actively working towards social change. Um, and I would jokingly refer to my finance studies as the non-helping professions. Um, and I think over time, like now we're at a place where our careers are starting to overlap more. And I've realized that every single profession, you have the opportunity to do this work, whether it's becoming an accountant and being an accountant for a nonprofit, whether it's doing the work of making sure folks are included within your organization, um, or I think in a lot of ways, like when I, I do transportation infrastructure finance, but that's something where it's important to bring that lens of equity and of justice to whatever work you're doing, regardless of whether you're actually working directly with people or members of the community or whether the work that you're doing is abstract. Um, I think that there is value to be gained from everyone taking the perspective that like, your profession is a helping profession and that you have a responsibility to do this work alongside the folks who are nurses and doctors and social workers and um, who are doing the sort of more direct and teachers doing the more direct service. So I would say um, bring, a, bring the lens of equity, like bring that commitment to social justice to the work that you're doing. And if people around you say that's not there's not really an opportunity to do that here, then make one. All right, awesome. So we recognize that we're almost at the time limit. Um, so if anyone wants to stay and share any stories or ask any additional questions, please feel free to, but we recognize that we're almost out of time. And we just wanted to thank the panelists again for coming and answering some great questions. And thank you everyone else for joining us tonight. Thank you all. So if anybody wants to stay, um, PCR coach Emily can stay on and lead us through a little sharing exercise, but we, we do know it is seven o'clock people or East coast time, seven o'clock. Uh, people have things like dinner and work and bed and school. So um, if you want to stay, feel free to, but if not, you're more than welcome to go. And thanks again to everybody for, for joining and to our panelists for sharing your wisdom. Yeah. Thank you for having us. This has been great. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Caitlin, am I supposed to stay or leave? <laughs> <laughs>
Catherine. <laughs>